Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Amanda Lamb. In today's deep dive conversation, we're talking with WREL reporter and anchor Ken Smith about one of the leading civil rights leaders who was from North Carolina and led the fight for school desegregation. And this is as WREL continues to celebrate Black History Month. Ken, welcome to the program. Great to be here. So really more fascinating historical ground covered in this story. A lot of people don't realize that the very foundation of a lot of the landmark civil rights legislation that was passed has roots right here in North Carolina. And it starts with Floyd McKissick Sr., who was connected with civil rights leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Tell us what happened to him in 1948. Well, Floyd McKissick Sr. Um, wanted to, of course, attend law school at UNC. And, um, of course, because of his race, he was denied access. So that went through the court system. That laid the groundwork for what eventually became the Brown versus Board of Education story that desegregated schools. But he was a national civil rights leader for his time. He was one of 10 speakers at the March on Washington. So in talking with his son, Floyd McKissick Jr., you got a sense that this was a man who was connected to the civil rights movement. Um, People like uh, Dr. King, Malcolm X, all the civil rights leaders at the time came through Durham to spend time with Floyd McKissick Sr. because at the time he was the leader of CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equality. Yeah. And I think, you know, going back to Brown v. Board of Education, I mean, you don't hear about McKissick versus Carmichael, but that's really fascinating to understand that that was, uh, as you said, laid the groundwork, the legal groundwork for yeah. this for that case. Um, so he went on to establish a law firm in Durham, um, civil rights, obviously, at the core of what his practice did. Tell me some of the things he accomplished. I mean, I know he was very involved in desegregation at UNC and also in the Durham Public Schools. Yeah, and and that's where Floyd McKissick Jr. came in because at a very early age, Floyd McKissick Jr. was on the picket lines. There are pictures of him at like nine years old picketing in front of an ice cream shop in Durham uh, back in the day when he was growing up. Uh, This was an ice cream shop, of course, that did not serve uh, African-Americans. And interestingly enough, he told this story about uh, a couple of years later when he was among the first to desegregate Durham schools. The daughter of one of the owners of that ice cream shop was his teacher. Wow. Six degrees of separation. Lots of connections. Lots of connections there. Uh, But in that instance, um, he equates a lot of his public service to his dad, who was just uh, at the time uh, interested in making sure that there were uh, equal rights for everyone, particularly African-Americans. And in that instance, one spring, he invited Malcolm X to Durham for a debate. And the debate was about integration versus assimilation. And he wanted to debate uh, Malcolm X, and he invited him to Durham. On the day that the event was supposed to happen, the city of Durham pulled the support for the event. Wow. So they were scrambling at the time trying to find a venue for this debate up until the very last minute. And they eventually found one on what was then Pine Street, which is now today South Roxborough Street. Oh, wow. A main street right Mm -hmm. in Durham. Let's talk more about... The debate and integration versus assimilation. You know, uh, and that was the question that um, Floyd McKissick Sr. wanted to debate with Malcolm X, because Malcolm X believed that in terms of assimilation um, and integration, he believed that if blacks were to integrate with whites, they would lose their black culture and and have these white values. On the other hand, Floyd McKissick Sr. believed that blacks could integrate and still maintain their culture and their heritage. And that was the debate of the day. And interestingly enough, um, Floyd McKissick Jr. said, in the end, it was less of a debate and more of two civil rights leaders really agreeing on most things because they agreed that um, there should be equal rights for African-Americans. There should be uh, a better, better living conditions for blacks, uh, economic um, development for blacks. So they basically agreed on most things. But that fundamental question. On the big things, but just this one Integration point. versus assimilation. They really differed on that point, And that was the key to that debate. 
And, you know, it's really interesting when you're talking about Floyd McKissick Jr. picketing at such a young age. I mean, he was born into this. And he's an attorney and also a very well-known state leader in his own right. He served for many years as a state lawmaker. I mean, I know this is a big question, but but how did his father's legacy shape him? It completely shaped him um, from the time he knew uh, the importance of his dad's work. Because I asked him, were you aware of the time growing up that uh, what what your dad was doing, the work he was doing, the importance of that work? And he said, yes, I was aware of it. I lived it. Many of these civil rights leaders spent time in my home. They were like uncles to me. So it was ingrained in him um, to follow what his dad was doing. So, And that's why he, he became a public servant, because in his time, he recognized what his dad was fighting for. And as a young man, because it was instilled in him, he took that to college. He took that to Harvard. He took that to Duke. And he told me the story about, you know, he was the only black kid in his integrated class. And if somebody were to look at that class and say, who would be the person to attend Duke University? Who would be the person to attend Harvard? He would not have been the one chosen, but he was actually the one who did all that because of of the lessons that he learned from the civil rights work of his dad. It went on to be Mm -hmm. very successful, obviously. Well, we will be back after the break with more from Ken Smith about Floyd McKissick Jr.'s take on the many contributions his father made nationwide. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download. I'm talking with Ken Smith about a North Carolinian who had a nationwide impact on civil rights, specifically on school desegregation. Ken, so many historical events that Floyd McKissick Sr. was involved with. I know he passed away in 1991. Um, Pretty astounding. You've already mentioned that he was one of 10 speakers in Washington uh, for the big civil rights event there in 1964. He was part of that visit from Malcolm X to Durham um, and Chapel Hill. And in 1966, he became the leader of CORE. Talk to me about the Congress of Racial Equality. What does that involve and and, and what does his son know about that and, and has that legacy continued? And I, and I asked about that because uh, at the time there was um, SNCC, which was started at Shaw University by college students. There was the NAACP, and then there was CORE. And for CORE, they were about direct action. Uh, a lot of times, the NAACP, um, they took their cases through the legal system. But CORE was an organization that was all about action and reaction. So, for example, they focused on sit-ins. They focused on demonstrations. They focused on the real action to get people's attention to make changes within their community. So that's really what set CORE apart because they were all about direct action and not necessarily taking cases to the legal system. They were about making sure that people recognized what the problem was. And when you sat in in an area where that was off limits to blacks, you saw the discrimination right there. So that's what CORE was about, getting to the core of the issue of civil rights at the time. Gotcha. Um, Another big event was when Floyd McKissick Sr. marched with James Meredith and Martin Luther King from Memphis to Jackson, Mississippi. I think it was like 270 miles over a span of 21 days. That was the summer of 1966. 15,000 marchers total. Um, The March Against Fear, it was called. And Floyd McKissick Jr. would have been about 14 at that time. Um, I'm sure this was heavily covered by the media. What does he remember about that? You know, he remembers uh, his dad going on that march. And he remembers so many things about the civil rights movement and that particular event. And he remembers how concerned he and his family were. About safety. About safety. Sure. uh, For his dad doing that. Yeah. Um, But he was so proud of, of what his dad was trying to accomplish. Because in his mind, he knew that his dad had to do this. It wasn't a matter of if he had to do it or should he do it. Because he was the leader of core, because he was such uh, an integral part of the civil rights, move, civil rights movement, McKissick Jr. Knew, knew his dad had to do that. His mom knew that uh, his dad, had, uh, her husband had to do that. And they supported him in doing that. And the biggest relief for him was when his dad came back home, safe and sound, but he knew he was making a difference by doing that march. 
Yeah, that's so powerful to think about that as a 14-year-old boy. Um, and, and that march helped massively with voting rights. They registered thousands of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it was obviously a very important historical event. Um, what is Floyd McKissick Jr. doing today? And, and does he have more that he wants to do? You know, he said right now he's... Um of course, running his successful law firm with his son. He's um, the th- three third generations, generation third lawyer. generation okay. uh, lawyer. And, um, uh, and, you know, after spending time in the state Senate, uh, Durham City Councilman, right now he's um, on the Utilities Commission. So that's taking up a lot of his time. But he says he will constantly work for the betterment of not just blacks in Durham, in the Triangle, but equal rights for everyone. Because he believes that that because of his upbringing, because of what he went through, he will always root for the little guy. He will always reach for that little guy. He will always reach for that person who does not have a voice. And he will continue to give a voice to people who've been silenced for so long. So that's really his focus right now, not necessarily in an elected position, but as a private citizen, as an attorney, he continues to fight for civil rights even today. And I know this is one of several stories that you're working on for Black History Month. What is it like just to hear this history firsthand, to uh, to talk about what he went through as a child, what he witnessed? It's so compelling and it's so eye-opening. And as an African-American, particularly as an African-American male, I have a deeper appreciation for the opportunities that I have had in my life because I am really and truly standing on the shoulders of people like Floyd McKissick Sr., Dr. King, even Floyd McKissick Jr. in talking with him and knowing what he went through as a young man uh, growing up and integrating Durham schools. He told me the story of running into the son of one of his former teachers when he was in the seventh grade. And he said, the gentleman came up to him and said, my mom was your teacher in the seventh grade. And he said, yes, Miss Eason, I really liked her because she treated me with respect. And and the son said, yeah, and she caught a lot of grief for it. And, as and a, he didn't know he it didn't at the know time. That. He didn't yeah. know that at the time. And he said, because her son shared that with him, he had an even deeper respect for her because he knew she risked it all just to treat him with respect Which in her was classroom. Unfortunately rare. Right. Back then. In that. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you for shedding light on this important history. And it's just been really fascinating to hear this story. You can watch Ken's story about the McKissicks tonight on WREL at 555 and 1045. Thanks for listening to the WREL Daily Download and making us part of your morning routine. If you like what you're hearing, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. Another great way to get WREL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email waiting in your inbox every morning with triangle news events and headlines to get you ready for the day. Sign up at WREL.com backslash newsletter.